Thank you very much. Right on, ministers, fellow industry colleagues, and guests to London, welcome at this time of the Olympics. You have may have noticed that the games are coinciding with one of the rarer outbreaks of better weather, but even rarer outbreaks of national optimism following our sporting successes. So I'll take this opportunity to defy some of the gloomier predictions about the UK energy industry, and I'll offer three reasons to be optimistic. My first is that the UK energy industry is in continuing to provide economic contribution amid profound uncertainty as we invest through the down cycle. The second is the UK oil and gas companies play a leading role globally, especially our integrated companies, including BP, BG and Shell. And my third reason is the optimism is the quality of our partnerships with national oil companies right around the world. So my first point, my first point, the industry's economic contribution, a contribution to global growth, to the development of emerging nations, and to the flow of taxes and dividends to governments and shareholders. At a fundamental level, energy is the lifeblood of civilization, and access to affordable energy is essential to fueling economic growth and reducing poverty. You have to only have to look at Iraq, with electricity blackouts impairing the country's development. The restoration of its energy infrastructure is in critical to improving people's lives and enhancing stability. With our partner Shell setting up a joint venture called the Basra Gas Company to capture gas produced from oil fields in South Iraq. At the moment, much of this gas is flared. The new venture will capture and deliver gas to generate electricity for the national grid and already we've implemented improvements to enhance supplies and cut down flaring. To see why this matters, consider how gas has helped to fuel the growth of countries like Japan and Korea during their most intensive periods of development. The energy industry's contribution takes many other forms. Low energy prices reduce input costs for virtually all goods and services throughout the economy. In the USA, the unconventional gas revolution has sent gas prices to the lowest point in a decade, providing the country with a powerful economic stimulus at the same time reducing CO2 emissions through backing out coal-fired power. Global energy demand is likely to double in the first half of the century as the global population expands and wealth levels rise in the emerging economies. To keep pace, the world will need to invest some $38 trillion by 2035, according to the IEA. That's $30 billion a week, more than double the estimated cost of the Olympics every week. This capital expenditure will flow through the global economy, creating jobs and generating demand for goods and services. Here in the UK, as the Minister mentioned, the oil and gas industry provided almost one quarter of the corporate taxes received by the Exchequer. And at Shell, we've managed to grow our dividends through the recession, and unlike the FTSE 100 as a whole. Actually, in fact, last year we paid 12% of all the dividends on the FTSE 100 at over $10 billion. So our industry contributes to the development and economic prosperity of nations whilst also delivering taxes and dividends to keep the economy moving forward. That leads me directly to my second point and second source of optimism. The oil and gas companies are playing a leading role globally. The twin pressures of rising demand and declining production rates in mature oil fields means by 2020, the world will need to produce another 30 million barrels of oil a day from new fields that haven't been developed yet. That's about three times Saudi Arabia's production of today. Much of this oil will come from technically challenging and geographically remote locations, from the Arctic to the deep waters in places like Southeast Asia. The pursuit of new ways to unlock oil and gas resources is relentless. And thanks to the North Sea standing as a center of innovation, the UK industry is in a strong demand in tapping these resources in fields such as subsea engineering or in gas plant design. The North Sea is packed with technical expertise forged over three decades in some of the industry's toughest operating environments. British companies are in particular at the forefront 
of major innovations in the global gas industry. At Shell, we started up the world's largest gas and liquids plant, Pearl GTL, in Gata. The plant, equivalent in surface area to Hyde Park, is our largest ever to equity investment, 12 to 18 to 19 billion dollars, and converts natural gas into high quality liquid fuels and products. The UK engineering and, su and supply chain have played a major role in bringing Pearl GT GTL to fruition. The plant was designed in Greenford in West London. The automation system, the largest ever built in our industry, was designed in Bracknell, and the 200 control cabinets were tested in Newhouse in Scotland. All told, Pearl GTL has generated over a billion dollars, a billion pounds of inward investment to the UK. At Shell, we've also recently started the construction of our Prelude floating LNG project, which will develop the Prelude gas field 200 kilometres off the Australian northwest coast. This giant floating facility will manufacture liquid, liquefied natural gas offshore. It is the first of a kind. This facility will be the length of a par 5 golf course. And at 600,000 tonnes, it will be the largest floating vessel man has ever built. So UK oil and gas companies are pioneering some of the world's industrial marvels. And as a humble UK engineer, I think we're a lot, we have a lot to be proud of. As an integrated company, combining our upstream and downstream capability delivers new innovative solutions for our customers. One example is our plan to sell LNG as a transport fuel for heavy trucks operating along Western Canada's busiest truck routes between Calgary and Edmonton. We're exploring the possibility of doing the same in the USA, drawing on North, North America's gas abundance. LNG is an effective way to reduce local emissions of sulfur dioxide and particulates, as well as being competitively priced alternative to diesel. In Europe, we've just bought a company called Gasnor, a Norwegian supplier of LNG for shipping in response to a growing desire among marine and industrial customers for cleaner burning fuels so they prepare for the introduction of stricter environmental regulations. A second advantage of our integration is that companies like Shell through our global reach can now match gas supplies with gas demand as the global energy market expands. We believe worldwide LNG supply and demand could double in the next 10 to 15 years. This will strengthen gas supply security for gas importers, not least here in Europe. It will also allow more countries to benefit from the environmental advantages of natural gas. By replacing coal-fired power, gas can slash the emissions of the pollutants that take such a toll on human health in Asia's growing cities. Gas also offers the fastest route to CO2 emissions reductions in the global power sector, because gas-fired power emits half of the CO2 of coal. This can have dramatic implications. And last year, CO2 emissions in the USA power sector were 11% lower than 2005, as gas prices have plunged and gas-fired power has replaced significant chunks of coal. LNG will especially important in cushioning the environmental impact of Asia's rising coal use. China is likely to become the world's largest LNG importer over the next two decades. And Southeast Asia is a growing demand setter. Thailand, for example, has recently become an LNG importer. Britain's integrated gas companies are playing a leading role here. At Shell, we're China's biggest LNG supplier by contracted equity volumes. And with our Asian partners, we recently announced plans to develop an LNG export facility on Canada's Pacific coast, an important step towards a trans-Pacific LNG trade. So British energy companies are leading the way in frontier areas right across the world. My final reason for optimism is the strength of our relationships with the world's national oil companies. Of course, these partnerships are nothing new. Under the traditional model, companies like Shell gained access to resources in return for technology or access to big consuming markets. But in recent years, national oil companies have grown stronger. They're moving beyond their borders, accessing resources around the globe. That calls for new kinds of strategic partnerships in which both sides grow together as equal partners over the long term. And at Shell, we've made strong partnerships with national companies in countries such as Gata, Saudi Arabia, and now China, with the likes of PetroChina. For some years, we've worked together with PetroChina to develop China's Thai gas resources. And we're now developing our joint capabilities across a wide range of fields in many different countries, including Australia, Qatar, and Canada. 
So that's mark one more way in which UK oil and gas companies are driving the latest developments in the global industry, forging partnerships with the emerging economic powerhouses of the world. I should finish with a word of thanks to UK Trade and Investment for their tremendous support to our business right across the world, ensuring that the world hears about our capabilities of our oil and gas sector, one of our most underrated national assets, and for me, a further demonstration that Britain is still great. Thank you.